Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents, and we have got a very encouraging word for God from God, from our Abba Father. And we need to be reminded at times that there are things we don't have to deal with now. Mm, mm, mm. I'm excited because I know two of these words are going to hit two of our members straight in the eye. And another one is going to lift the other one's spirit up. And everybody else that's in our group, they're going to hear theirs when we, they hear it on video. All right. So, you ready? Get set, ready, go. All right. Let me get my Bible set up here. Now, <laughs> we're going to Isaiah chapter 38. Yes. Starting at verse 5. See, there are times when life hits us, questions haunt us, and possibilities, positive or negative, can definitely scare the boo-boo out of us. And God is giving us words of confirmation, affirmation, validation, encouragement, all kind of stuff. So I want you to see if you get your word out of this. Because we know we're living in trying times. We know there are things that are jumping off that we have never seen before. We know we're right in the middle of historical moments and biblical moments. So listen to this and let God encourage you. Now, this is just an insert. Many of you notice how YouTube pushes some of the silliest videos and they make hundreds of thousands of views. But life-changing videos don't get that much traction. And I'm asking you, if you feel like my channel is a blessing to you, like, comment, subscribe. And if you really feel like it's a, a blessing and God leads you to, please consider donating through PayPal or through mail. God bless you. The details will be in the description box or the comment pin box below. Thank you. This is Isaiah chapter 38 and we are starting at verse 5. Now Hezekiah, he was told to get his house in order because he was getting ready to die, right? All right. So listen to this. For those of you who get negative doctor reports, who get scares from your blood tests and all of that, listen to this. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, go and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord. And I'm speaking this to every one of your fears. Listen, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. God is saying to some of you, he's already added years to you. He's already added length of time. If Jesus tarries from his rapture, your years are already added up. Listen. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city. Some of y'all really need some good defense right now. God's got your back. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. And again, you know, basically I'm saying he turns the clock back by 10 minutes or 10 degrees or whatever. Okay, now we're not going to go into all that. The main thing I want you to hear is what God has to say to you. All right, now, in Isaiah 37, verse 33, I got to read that and then we'll move on. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, for those of you who have a threat knocking on your door, who have legal papers and all kind of hassles and harassments at your job with your family members, with, with all kind of legal crap, with the bank, with your credit, whatever. Listen to this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Syria, 
he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast the bank against it. In other words, ain't gonna happen. It ain't going down as Isaiah chapter 7 says, it shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. Have a good night's sleep, baby. Take a good nap. Rest in the Lord. Be at total peace because God ain't going to let your enemies triumph over you in any way, shape, or form. So kick it, chill, and relax. Rest in the Lord. I, I did a song for Peter last week. Rest, the Lord is near. Refuse to fear. Enjoy his love. Trust his mighty power rules every hour of every day. There is no need for needless worry. With such a savior, you have no cause to ever doubt. His perfect love still reassures in every trial. Call him if you get frightened. Call him with loving care. He'll lift your burdens and you'll rest. The Lord is near. Refuse to fear. Enjoy his love. God bless you. Be encouraged. And now we're getting ready to share a little bit. And I'll get back to the word. We're going to Isaiah 42 in a minute. But right now, I just want to share this with you. There are times when Satan rattles your cage. Satan sends all kind of boogeymen after you. He wants you running so fast that you don't even know where you're going. He wants you to run into brick walls and fall into pit holes and, and hurt yourself trying to get away from harm's way. But guess what? You don't have to run. You don't have to hide. Your hiding place is God. God knows how to get you out of a pickle. God knows how to set things in order to make things work out for you. It's in his timing. You have no idea what God is capable of doing. As Ephesians 3.20, he will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think according to the power that works in you. Your power is in your faith. Your power is in how hard you lean on God. Are you leaning? Are you trusting? Do you really believe that he's not only willing, but able? There's a song that says, um, like peering through a window blurred with rain. Emotions run together in a flood of doubt and pain. Mm. We prayed as best we can. Now we must leave it in his hands. Yet I know when my eyes fail to see, he is able. And even though it seems impossible to me, he is able. And if he chooses not to move in the way we prayed he would, I'm confident he's working all together for my good. And I will stand upon his word, for he is able. Questions seem to haunt me night and day. How could God allow my heart to be torn this way? Does he listen when I call? Is he even there at all? Yet I know when my eyes fail to see, he is able. And even though it seems impossible to me, he is able. And if he chooses not to move in the way we prayed he would, I'm confident he's working all together for my good. And I will stand upon his word for he is able. He's able. All right. Some of you are dealing with people on your job. Some of you are dealing with people in your family. A lot of friction. A lot of uh, uh, 
yays and no's and naysayers and head shakers and attitudes and smart lips and snide remarks. A lot of distance being kept by family, like Lynn was saying the other day, how there's a big divide between the vax and the non-vax and all of that. There are a lot of reasons why families divide, a lot of reasons why you have friction on your jobs, a lot of reasons why some of you can't get along with God's own people at church, some in your own household, or your biggest enemies. But, and some of your relatives or your main strangers in your life because they don't want any part of you if you don't believe what they believe and if they don't believe what you believe in it's crazy what's going on nowadays but let me share this god does not want you tripping off of people he does not want you tripping off of their attitudes he does not want you tripping getting all shaken and bent out of shape over their little snide remarks listen to what god says in isaiah this is more of a litany of encouragements more than anything else today i've never done this before like this i just feel like god's got a lot of people out there with a lot of cases that need to be addressed to encourage them to believe and trust in him all right listen isaiah chapter 2 Verse 22 says, cease ye, cease means to stop, quit it, quit tripping. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. For wherein is he to be accounted for? You know, accounted of, we put so much store in what the boss says what the supervisor says, what the co-worker says, what the neighbor across the street said about us behind our back, what my brother said, what my sister said, what my mama, my papa, my, my cousin, my daughter, my son, whatever the case is, we put way too much store in what people say, the in-laws and the outlaws. We we worry about what they think about us, what their attitude is, how how they want to get rid of us. If they're angry with us, oh no, my life is coming to an end. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. You got to look at it like sometimes you drive through an area with the window down on a breezy day. And you're traveling somewhere else, but you're in the middle, you're in betwixt and between. You're not at your destination. Your window is down. You're looking out the window. The scenery looks pretty nice, but all of a sudden, a foul odor hits your nose. And you're like, what the heck is that? You might have gone past the cow patch. You know how bad that mess smells. But guess what? You're going past it. And many of you look at your problems as if you're stuck there forever. You're going through. You're going past it. It will soon be behind you. And so will the stench of it. It will be gone too. Every season has its schedule. Every season begins. Every season ends. Summer doesn't last always. Winter doesn't last always. Seasons have their identifiable marks. And you have to understand, remind yourself, this that I'm in right now is a season. It's not a life sentence. It's a season. All right. So you can't allow the vicissitudes of life to turn your head backwards. Have you stumbling over your own two feet? You cannot hit panic mode. You cannot run. Put this fire out over here. And you got to run over here. Put that fire over there. You got to run over here. Put that fire on. If you don't handle it, it's going to be out of control. You ain't God, baby. Sit down. Thank you, Lord. And now we're going to Psalms 46. Because y'all got to remember who God is and who you ain't. Sorry for the bad English, but you know, I do things for effect. Psalms 46, God, not you. 
Mm -hmm. When was the last time you spelled your name G-O-D? Yahweh. J-E-S-U-S. -S. Mm -hmm. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help. He's not an absentee dad. Therefore will not we fear. Don't fear. Though the earth be removed. Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled. Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river. The stream shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. You shall not be moved. God shall help her. God's going to help you. And that right early. The heathens raised. The kingdoms will move. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord, the God of Jacob, is our refuge. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to read the rest later because that's going to be the end of the message. But I want you to understand who's with you in this thing. Huh? Years ago, when I was 12 years old, I got in the pool at Betsy Head Pool in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to dog paddle. Now, I was a water lover, even though I almost drowned four times. And this was one of those times. <laughs> I was determined and did learn how to swim. Listen, I'm in the pool. This is a dual, this is uh, cutting both ways on this one. Number one, it talks about what happens when you panic. And number two, it lets you know what happens when somebody's watching over you in the middle of your panic. All right. One thing I learned, and some of you who like water, who fear water, I don't know what your attitude is toward water. But water can be your best friend if you know how to work with it. And I didn't know how to work with it. I hadn't learned how to float at that point. Had I learned how to float, I wouldn't have been so quick to panic. I would have flipped over on my back and said, can somebody get me over to the other side? I can't swim. But I panicked. And most of you, that is your downfall. When you panic, you make emotional decisions. You make snap choices. You jump over here. You jump over there. And then when everything falls apart, you're sitting there wondering, oh, no, why, how, what happened? You panicked. But see, I got to get to the pool. Let me tell the pool, and then I want to share with you how to do an experiment at night in your house, turning all the lights out. Lord, don't let me forget that since you brought that to my mind. All right. So here I am in the pool, and I'm dog paddling. But I forget. I'm in a 15-foot pool, not the little three-foot, four-foot one. I'm in the 15-foot one. I'm out of my league, out of my element. And when I realized I couldn't feel the bottom, I hit the panic mode with everything I could pull out. And I'm grasping and gasping for air and scratching the water and flailing. And oh my, it was a mess. I was so embarrassed afterwards. I said, no, we ain't having this again. I'm going to learn how to swim. And as I'm flailing around, I'm going deeper and deeper. See, that's what happens when you panic. When you panic, you're not solving the problem. You're making matters worse. So I'm going deeper and deeper. Listen to this analogy. I'm getting deeper and deeper in trouble because I'm getting further and further away from the air I need to breathe. So what happens? I see something splash through the water like a bullet. And it was a cute little, uh, I don't know how old he was. It looked like he couldn't be no more than 10 years old. Like in elementary school. But he dives in. This boy. He was one of the junior lifesavers. 
And he grabbed me and pulled me over to the side, up to the surface and over to the side. Saved my life, y'all. A kid saved another kid's life. See, <laughs> number one, I made it worse by panicking, like most of you. But number two, God had my back, even though I wasn't thinking about him at that time in my life. God had my back. And he had a little boy sitting over there watching. And he came and saved my life. No matter what you're in, there is safety. God has a safety net. God has a lifesaver. God has a rescue. God has a way of escape. He has a way that will help you. He will deliver you out of your problem. He will, because he is a very present help like that lifesaver was in the water. So my life got saved. Did I get deterred from wanting to swim? No, I was that much more determined. And I learned to swim. And now the water's my best friend. Get a cramp, flip over on your back, baby. Lay back and breathe. You're all right. You'll get to the side in a minute. Take your time. No rush. Don't panic. Rest. When I rest in the water, I float on the water. When you wrestle with the water, you sink. That's what happens. All right. Next, the dark. The Lord gave me this illustration years ago when we had a, uh, I used to do an overcomers group with men and women on Monday and Thursday nights. And this particular night, uh, it was, it was nighttime. It was, it, it must've been around the fall because it was, it was dark at seven and we met at seven o'clock. So we were talking about dealing with surprise problems in our lives, crisis issues and not hitting the panic button. And the Lord instructed me to tell them to turn the lights out. And I said, everybody look around the room, look around the room real good right now. And everybody's looking around the room. I said, what do you see? And they mentioned all the things they saw. I said, now, I said, so-and-so, would you please turn out the, every light, every single light in here? And they turned out the lights. And now we're all in the dark. Do you know it almost looked like it was pitch black? We couldn't see anything. I couldn't. I mean, we were sitting in a circle, you guys. We couldn't have been no further away from each other than 12 feet. You hear me? There were about 18 of us sitting around in that circle. So the circle wasn't that big. We weren't that far away from each other. But do you know I couldn't see the people? Next, couldn't see them next to me. Couldn't see them across from me. It was dark in that room. So I said, okay, everybody, let's wait a while. I said, number one, tell me what you see. Oh, we don't see nothing uh, but that little uh, street light at a distance that looks like it's trying to come through the window, but it's dark in here, right? I said, keep waiting. Keep waiting. Wait in a minute and then tell me what you see. We waited. We had somebody time it. And then she said, okay, time, because they had a you know, little clock that would you know make a sound. So sure enough, we said, okay, what do you see? They said, oh, uh, I think I see so-and-so. I don't know who it is, but somebody sitting right across from me looked like they got something on their lap. I said, give it two more minutes. I said, okay, let's talk. In the meantime, we chit-chatted. After a couple of minutes, I said, what do you see? Oh, wow, so-and-so has a sweater on, and they got a, some books in their lap, and so-and-so has a pocketbook hanging off their chair. I said, the longer you wait, the more you see, don't you? Yeah, why? Because your eyes have become acclimated to the dark. God becomes our light in the darkness. If you wait on the Lord before you panic on the problem, God will open your eyes and you will see what's really going on. But if you panic and you get deeper and deeper in the problem and make the problem and matters worse, now you got a whole lot more to have to adjust to. You got a whole lot more issues to have to get delivered from, don't you? That's why the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. God is our light 
in the darkness. He will shed his light into your darkness, y'all. By about five or six minutes, it was almost like somebody had turned a soft light in the room. We were seeing the piano over there. We could see all the furniture that was behind us. We could see the little things on the wall. We could see a lot. And it was such an eye-opener, pardon the pun, of how we should wait before we react. When we hear bad news, when something bad happens, when we're in the middle of a crisis, it's not the time to respond unless you're saving a life. But you don't panic. You don't panic. Your life should be more strategic than reactionary. Your mouth should be shut and your mind and ears should be open, waiting on the Lord, praying quietly, Lord, what do I do? Psalms 32. We're almost done. It's not going to be a long message. Psalms 32. Because when you ask the Lord, what should you do? Here is his answer. Hmm. Verse 7 and on to the end. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. And this is God's response. I will instruct thee in the way in which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as a horse or a mule. In other words, don't be stubborn now. Don't fight me on this. Hmm. Which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. You hear me? Got to remember who God is when you're in the middle. Something, Somebody says something. That offends you. They blame you for doing something or feeling something. You don't know what the heck they're talking about. First thing, before you respond to them, you take a minute, step back. Lord, what do I do? What do I say? How do I handle this? Help me with this one. Before you lean to your own understanding and handle it your way. Somebody says you did something you didn't do. You ain't got to stand up there and say, no, I didn't. No, you're lying on me. How could you do that to me? I thought we would know. Shut your mouth. What did Moses do when they jammed up on him? What did he do? He said, I tell you what. He got his instruction from the Lord and he said, I'll meet you at 3.30 tomorrow. And God will say, who's who? And what's what? And when they met, the earth swallowed them up and burnt the rest of them. That ended that argument. God let them know who his man really was. See, there are times you want to defend yourself. You want to, you want to cry out. You want to fight the good fight because as far as you're concerned, they're not going to treat you like this. They're not going to mistreat you, disrespect you, diss you, uh, uh, kick you to the curb, throw you under the bus. Yeah, and yeah, they might throw you under the bus. They just might do it. But God's going to make sure the bus doesn't run over you. <laughs> I mean, God has a way. It's above our ways. He's beyond finding out. He's beyond figuring out. He knows how to keep us out of trouble. He knows how to keep all evil out of our lives. Yes, we're in an evil world, but we're not overcome by it, are we? No, we will come, we will overcome evil with what? What did Jesus say? Overcome evil with good. You handle everything God's way. And you will find God will vindicate you. God will validate you. God will back you and defend you. 
Listen. What did Jesus do during the crucifixion, before the crucifixion, when they started lamb blasting him with all these, all this interrogation? They were interrogating him here and interrogating him there, and they were questioning him and doubting him and checking him out and, and, and putting him on the spot and what about this and what about that what do you guys say about this what do you have to say about that blah 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 what did Jesus say nothing thou sayest he did not defend himself not one iota what did he say when the guy said uh you know I have the power to make you live or die why don't you speak to me Jesus said hey you ain't got no power baby God's got the power. He can send 10,000 angels. <laughs> Jesus knew who he believed in. Do you? Do you? Do you really know him? See, that's part of our problem, trying to trust God, is we're trying to trust a God, a God. We don't know. And I say a God because for many born-again Christians, true born-again Christians, God is a stranger. The only thing they know about God is in these in these words and in the red letter. That's all we know. But when you know God, when you experience God and you know he loves you, you know he's for you. And when you're hurting and you're scared, you say, Lord, talk to me. And God says, Isaiah chapter 7. And you're worried about them taking you to court. And you go to Isaiah 7 and you read it and it says, it shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. You say, oh, that means they're not going to take me to court. They're not going to sue me. Thank you, Lord. When you start seeing God talk to you directly every single time, through his word and in your spirit, you know, you know that God is real. Here I am hurting. I'm at a church. Years ago, this happened. I'm at a church and this man Oh, he's the pastor of the church. It was Victory Bible, as a matter of fact. And I'm sitting in there when they won Howard and uh, I can't think of the other street. But anyway, here they were, Howard and Hill or whatever. So here I am at the church and uh, the pastor, well, they might have still been on Lincoln. Either way, the pastor had invited our church over to theirs. And it was Pastor Henry. And I'm sitting toward the back. Because I'm hurting, I'm thinking that the pastor that I'm under doesn't like me and wishes I'd leave the church. And I'm extremely emotional, I'm extremely fragile, I'm hurting, I'm, I'm tormented, I'm thinking maybe I should just get up and slip out and never come back. And Oh my God, I was miserable, do you hear me? I was so caught up in it that I couldn't even think to ask God what I should do. This is what I love about God. When he knows you're overwhelmed, he knows how to send a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. Just like when I was overwhelmed with water and I couldn't get out, lifesaver right there on the, on the money. This man didn't know me from Adam, y'all. I will never forget this. The pain I felt. Sometimes we hurt off of shadows. Sometimes the little boogeyman and the little things that Satan puts in our heads makes us so miserable and hurts our feelings so bad. And there's no truth in it, but we're tied up in knots now and we don't know how to handle it. What did God do? He had Pastor uh, Henry look at me directly. It was like the Lord pointed me out to him. And he said, young lady in the so-and-so, would you please stand up? And I'm about to look around. He said, don't look around. He said, I'm looking at you. Now look at me. He says, yes, you. I want you to stand up. My face is soaked with tears, y'all. And trust me, I look ugly, not ugly, ugly when I cry hard like that. So I'm standing up trying to cover my face because I'm still crying because I don't know what he's going to do or what he's going to say. And he says, God showed me that Satan's been lying to you and he wants me to tell you all that you've been feeling today, all that you've been afraid of. It's a lie. 
There's no truth in it. So wipe your weeping eyes. God's got you. You're all right. And remember, all that you were crying about was nothing but a lie from the devil. It was such a moment of deliverance. I can't tell you how relieved I was to know that my pastor didn't hate me. See, when you have a lot of insecurities and you have a lot of emotional scars, shadows can hurt your feelings. That's how sensitive you can be. <laughs> I still had to go through a lot of inner healing during that time. But God delivered me from that moment. And as soon as that was said, the peace returned. And then I was crying out of gratefulness that God even was mindful of me. When I think about that, it brings tears to my eyes, not because of the pain, but because of God's attentiveness. He knows when we're hurting, even when we can't voice it. He knows when we're scared. He knows when we're beside ourselves in fear and worry. And God is right there, a very present help if you would just be there. I didn't want to go to church, but I went. What would have happened if I hadn't gone to church? And I didn't get that word. And I reacted to what I felt rather than what God said to me directly because I presented myself broken, busted, messed up, hurting, but I, I went. Some of the blessings we miss out on because we don't show up. When you show up, you're trusting God in spite of how you feel. When you want to curl up in the ball and stay in the bed and cry your eyes out and have a good full-blown pity party, God is saying, get up and meet with the saints. I got a word waiting for you there because he operates through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate, operate through God's people. So do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together with other believers. You can miss out on some tremendous blessings. One night, we had night service in Pasadena, Pasadena Church of God, and Pastor Cushman had the altar call. He, he felt like everybody just needed to come to the altar and pour their heart out to the Lord. So I'm at the altar, and I forget what the problem was, but I had a problem. And I was all tied up in knots about it. And I was asking God to help me figure out what to do, how to handle it and all that. And one lady walks by me. She didn't kneel down and pray with me. She didn't ask me what the problem was. She didn't say a mumbling word. She laid her hand on my back shoulder. And as soon as she laid her hand on my back shoulder, the peace of God swamped all over me. And all that turmoil just poof, went up in a puff of smoke. And I said, God, thank you for that touch. I knew that was a direct touch from God, not from uh, sister so-and-so. It was from God because it had an eternal, a supernatural effect. When you know God, when you know his touch, you know his voice, you know his love, you know he's in your corner, you know he's attentive and mindful of you. You're not so quick to panic. The more that happens, and sometimes that's why we have to go through all that stuff. Because with every progressive moment, at every progressive turn, God is proving himself to us little doubtful babies on this planet. And with every moment of proof, with every intervention, our faith is steadily being built, 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 till we get to the point we don't hit the panic button anymore. We just wait on the Lord. But that's part of growth. 
So if you're still panicking, don't beat yourself up. Don't let the devil give you condemnation. Therefore now there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Trust me. <laughs> you have no need to be guilty. You're still growing towards that level of trust. And it's a progression. You don't get there all of a sudden when you get saved. That takes time. So give yourself time to grow into it. All right. God already knows who he called into his kingdom. He knows our uprising and our down sitting. He knows our weaknesses. Our, he knows everything about us. So there's nothing we can do that will blow his mind or take him aback. He knows what's happening with us as individuals. He knows what to expect at every turn, at every crisis, at every problem, even the sins that beset us. He knows. So trust yourself in his care. He cares for you. Casting all your care on him because he cares for you. Amen. And we're going to close with this scripture and I am done. <clears throat> all right. You know that old song, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. That's what we have to do. Lean on him. If you want a crutch, baby, God is it. He is unbreakable. Ha. All right. Here we go. And we're in Psalms 46, and we are closing with verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. Verse 9, he maketh wars to cease. Even the wars that stir up in your own soul, in your own mind. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in sunder. Satan's tossing all kinds of spears at you. And God's breaking every single one. Hmm. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. Be encouraged.